Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer and my guest today is C.C. Lee. Um, C.C. is a waking down teacher or whatever they call him. We'll get the terminology straight as we go along. And I've interviewed quite a few of those including Samuel Linda, Linda Bonder who founded Waking Down and Mutuality. And you know, I've been thinking that these days embodiment is kind of a buzzword in, in spiritual circles. Everybody's talking about it. Um, whereas 10 years ago, the majority of people were kind of talking about disembodiment. Oh, you're, you're not a person and all that. But from the get-go, Waking Down has been all about, uh, you know, well as, as C.C.'s book implies, becoming divinely human. Um, you, you know, there are people who say you are not a person. I suppose a Waking Down teacher might respond to say, yes, of course you're not. Of course you're a person. You're just not only a person. You know, there's, that's just, there, there are different dimensions to what you are. And Waking Down in Mutuality, as I understand it, and we're going to be talking all about it today, is all about integrating and, and stabilizing all those dimensions so as to live the full package rather than just some fragmented part of it. Is that a fair uh, synopsis, CC? That's a good way to begin, Rick. Great. Um, so what I'd also like to let's talk, let's talk about you personally a little bit for a while, and then we'll kind of go through your book and uh, cover all kinds of points, I'm sure, as we go along. And, and there'll be an opportunity for people to submit questions um, during the interview. Um, so just this morning, I read your personal bio on your website, and uh, I thought it was very interesting. So it might be good to go through that a bit, um, just off the top of your head. So, so people kind of get to know you and get a sense of, you know, how your life led up to where it is now. And then we'll talk more specifically about what you have in your book and everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you, have... you were born at a very young age and? <laughs> <laughs> I was very small. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And there's something about a sunflower. And, and when you were a child, you, you, st you, ha you were sort of having subtle perceptions and communications with, with nature spirits or some such thing. Right. I suppose I was, like many people, something of a magical child. Mm -hmm. And I, one day, and I was adventurous. I, I didn't uh, always follow mom's rules. I wandered away from home a bit further than usual and came across a pair of sunflowers growing out by the road. And was gazing up at the big heads of the sunflowers and all of a sudden just felt completely enveloped and suffused and um, awash in something I'd never felt before. And it was like they loved me, Un you know, just totally. And I think I ran home and told everybody about these amazing sunflowers, and I think I got grounded. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing way over there? And you're making up stories, and yeah. that's just your imagination. And you know, who are you to be? Uh, what kind of magic mushrooms we're nibbling out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so I lost touch with that for a long time until in 1987, which I think was a kind of awakening year for a lot of people. The harmonic convergence, if you, if that rings any bells for people. Yeah, I remember that. I was sitting out in a field. I had a house in Scotts Valley near Santa Cruz, and I walked out into a big dry field where there was no water and no nothing planted, just weeds, and there was a sunflower growing there. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and gazed at that sunflower and felt taken back to that time when I was five. And it just connected everything up for me, the sense that there was something so vital, so alive, so uh, profoundly loving. And I was part of that. And that really sparked um, me to move into an active seeking phase at that point. Mm. It's interesting because um, I don't know a lot about Native American spirituality, but as I understand it, they, you know, very often when they go through some initiation thing during their youth, they end up uh, resonating with some particular animal or something that's going to be their connection to higher realities. It might be a wolf or a bear or something, and they end up naming themselves after that. And so for you, it, it was kind of a sunflower, you know? It's kind of interesting. 
Right, right, right. But I, um, please don't, everyone, start calling me sunflower. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting sunflower. <laughs> Although I do treasure sunflowers. Yeah. All right, we won't. Um, so, okay, so take us from there. Well, I, in my early 20s, I experimented a lot. I, I came from a broken home. My parents split up when I was eight. My dad was a thousand miles away and even just that far emotionally as well, not very available. My mom was pretty devastated by the breakup and she was quite emotionally unavailable as well. And somehow kept a home together, but it was, it was very minimal as far as, you know, it being a nurturing environment. So I, uh, by the time I was in college, I was desperate for love and desperate to understand something and started experimenting a lot with boys and with psychoactive substances. I got into a dormitory at the University of Massachusetts where dropping acid was kind of the thing you do on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was mind blowing, took me way out of any frames of references I'd had up to that point. And yet I often was disappointed that I wasn't encountering, you know, the deity of mescaline or you know, whatever I was looking for. But one, one of those journeys did absolutely take me down inside the very structure of how things are, how things are in reality. It's like I was inside the frequencies seeing the scale that went from solid to liquid to sound to to light to color and i was able to just travel in between all of those frequencies and um, i had no context for understanding that i had no way to really even talk about it but i remember it till now so yeah. that was useful as far as just letting me know that physical reality wasn't all there is. Yeah, that was that kind of thing was an eye opener for many of us. It, certainly not a long term uh, solution, but definitely gave you a, kind of an unforgettable glimpse into the fact that there's more to life than meets the eye. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, next step. Well, I majored in animal science in college, and after that, I became a, we could, well, we, today we would call them a dog whisperer. Mm. I raised dogs, I trained and showed them, and I made my living by working with people, helping them raise their dogs and helping them deal with behavior problems. And that was really interesting, although I also had quite an interest in psychology, I think I was guided, or maybe because I was such a broken person, maybe animals were a safer medium, but they also kept the heart open. And so it was a wonderful way to relate to people through the medium of dogs, because they're so heart-based. Yeah. And I learned a lot about people and about teaching and about coaching through that avenue. Yeah, I think a lot of people find that you know, animals and dogs are a lot easier to deal with than human beings. You know, they're a lot less complicated. And so um, we, you know, and, and as you say, they really bring some heart into the, into the equation. So did you feel like your animal communication thing, your dog whisperer thing was, must have been kind of tied in with the fact that you had some subtler perception dawning or having dawned at some point and uh, so you couldn't just be a sort of a scientist uh, studying blood samples or something you, you, you know you had to sort of bring your your latent talents to bear in uh, in uh, the field of your choice it's really true Rick when I was in college there was a lot of I was encouraged to study things where you dissect animals you know yeah. to be sci a scientist in that regard in the laboratory or or even doing research on humans in, in psych experiments, none of that felt right to me. I 
knew I had to be with the whole being. Yeah. And the animating spirit of that being, you know, wasn't going to be found in the test tubes and in the laboratories. Yeah. Okay. And so next step. Okay. So that, so I got, I had a home and a dog kennel and a husband. And um, I think those are my years of making a life, just learning how to navigate in the real world, have a business. And then we come up to that shift point in 1987. And at that point, things seemed to be falling apart. It was one of the first, I think one of my first dark night experiences <clears throat> where things that had been working well just all started falling apart and not working. And lots of things went wrong. And that sent me, actually sent me to the meditation cushion. Like your, your marriage broke up at that point, didn't it? Shortly after yeah. I started sitting and inquiring and meditating and trying to learn how to meditate really and and that got too strange because i started channeling mm. at that point just spontaneously so when, yeah pretty yeah. much spontaneously although i had studied metaphysics and i'd studied channeled material so i had a framework for what it was i never in a million years expected it would happen for me but when I started to get quiet and listen, I had responses coming back to me in, in my inner awareness. And I just developed that into a form of communicating with guides mm -hmm. who were seeming to show up for my education and learning. And, and that just um, weirded my husband out no end. <laughs> Just for your education, or were you actually sort of helping clients with your channeling? I was leery of doing that. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't mm -hmm. go down that route, actually. It, it, it felt like something I could learn from, but I didn't see that taking money for it was the way to go. Yeah. All right, so your husband wasn't exactly thrilled <clears throat> with this turn of events. Um, and right, and the marriage broke up yeah. <clears throat> pretty quickly, and things led to things. And I ended up, over the period of the next year or two, I ended up giving up that home and coming to dead ends for everything I was attempting at that point. And, I mean, so I guess there was a few years of, of ex exploration and growth and experimenting with uh, altered states and different contact with things. It, it actually felt very wonderful for a while, and then it stopped being productive, and I hit another dark night, mm. which was even more whole, whole scale. You know, every level of my being, I just fell into self-doubt, and I felt in all of my shadow, all of my self-judgment, my wicked inner critic just went on a rampage and I kind of just caved I just caved the reason I'm having you go through this stuff is that um, people can relate to it you know I, I mean often teachers get up on stages and uh, or on YouTube or whatever and they're talking and and they they kind of present themselves as this shining example of enlightenment and you don't have any sense of what they might have been through uh, or might, what they might still be going through, which we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, it's, I think it can be, and people get this subtle feeling that, oh, I could never be like them, you know. Uh, but I think it can be sort of encouraging for people to realize that, as the fire sign theater put it, we're all bozos on this bus. And, uh, you know, people have been, th you know, spiritual teachers who seem very, to really have their act together have been through all kinds of stuff over the years to get to where they are today and are, again, still going through stuff. So well, I, I just want to throw that in there just to give your voice a rest for a second and uh, put it in context. Yeah, thank you. I think that's very right on, Rick. <clears throat> in fact, I got so good at failure, I used to 
joke that I was going to teach a course called Advanced Failure <laughs> because people should teach what they're good at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and that was that was the way uh, that was the way it was showing up for me. And <laughs> what was really happening, I think, is that I had opened myself up to very beautiful um, belief systems about a multi-dimensional reality and that I was a very special part of that and that I had a special destiny. And I really fell into that, into being almost seduced by it for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened, and I don't really know why, but maybe organically I was just ready for, to go deeper. Yeah. I had to go deeper in order to really find what's true. and. You know, and, and beliefs weren't, it wasn't about beliefs. It wasn't about pictures of reality that you choose to believe this or choose to believe that. That lost all of its interest to me. Mm. And I said, how can I get grounded in a way? How can I get here in a real way? Mm. And can I go deeper? Can I have an exploration that takes me to something that feels utterly true that's interesting about you know feeling you were special because I, I think um, egotism is a kind of can be insidious and and it, it can it, and you know we're the last people to know it when it's creeping in up on us uh, others may be able to see it perhaps but um, you know it, it blinds us to itself and uh, you know and many teachers especially when they well you aren't at the teacher stage yet, but many teachers, especially when they start getting showered with a lot of attention and praise and, you know, love, and it can really go to their heads. And um, so I know that in Waking Down there are kind of mutual safeguards against this kind of thing, but if, of course you hadn't gotten into Waking Down yet. But anyway, it's an interesting thing that you kind of recognized that in yourself on your own and um, sounds like move through it. Well, I got humbled, Rick. Yeah. You got smacked down by circumstances a bit, huh? Yeah, it wasn't, certainly wasn't because I was wise and saw the error of my ways. <laughs> yeah. It was because something uh, smarter than me just looking out for you, looking out for me to bring me to my knees and actually crack me open so that, so that I might discover something much more important than, you know, this little person with her ideas about what reality is. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm starting to talk more. Uh, then, so that, that kind of resonates with one of my favorite themes, is, which is that, you know, and I've said this many times, which is that, you know, the universe is like this big evolution machine and, and we're here to grow. And there's an intelligence that is going to facilitate or push along our growth, uh, whether we cooperate with it or, you know, resist it kicking and screaming. Uh, but there, there is that kind of core force that uh, influences and governs and guides our lives. And uh, it's interesting to reflect upon that sometimes in discussions like this. Well, Some there certainly seems to be a theme that has pulled me along and, and um, was pretty early on to give me a sense of what my purpose is here in this life and then and then provide me all the challenges and reasons to be disillusioned and deconstructed in order to make me a vessel yeah we might say to be able to support other people in awakening I sometimes think that the word dissolution has, really has a positive connotation for spiritual aspirants because we really, you know, what, what spirituality is all about is coming out of illusion. So if we can get disillusioned, that's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> uh, although it's not always pleasant while it's happening, but um, it can really be, you know, conducive to our, our growth. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying, actually, because the way we're structured, it's, or the way I was structured, certainly, thought it had some idea about how to be in the world and how to take care of things. And when all that started crumbling around me, mm -hmm. I lost touch with my, my north, my compass. It's like, and 
it was quite bewildering yeah. and devastating in a way, just feeling, I guess simultaneously like I wanted to, to make a contribution here through this life of mine and that I was utterly not up to it, that I was just not going to be able to deliver. I was so flawed and so broken. And, and it's one, you know, humble sounds almost like a positive quality, but there's a way in which it, it was more like, oh, I'm just completely not fit, unable, inadequate, and hopeless. Yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily, I mean, there are different ways of defining words, and that, that's perhaps one way of, you know, defining humble is like, oh, I'm so unworthy and, uh, you know, incapable and, and all sorts of things like that. But a, another nicer way of defining humble is just, um, you know, not insisting that things happen any particular way, being uh, willing to um, align with higher intelligence if one can fi find a way to align with it so that you're not getting in its way. Um, that, that's the way I'd like to define humble. Oh, I totally agree yeah. that 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 was the ultimate outcome. Yeah, you know, to to just be, you could say, just be really to just be, mm -hmm. and not try to be something big or something small. You know, not just being exactly what size I am, <laughs> <laughs> and doing what I can in the moment and showing up, mm -hmm. and that's kind of just been how it's been. Yeah. So I haven't asked you for specifics about all these things that humbled you and knocked you down and all. I don't know if that's even necessary because everybody's going to have their own specifics and it might be good to stick to general principles. Um, but so after this, I guess you might have called, you might, in breaking down terms, you might call this a rot period uh, where everything was falling apart for you and uh, nothing was working out and, you know, nature was smacking you around. Um, was there a light at the end of the tunnel that you eventually kind of came into? Yes. The, the Again, it took me, just like that earlier um, dark night period kind of brought me to the meditation cushion, this one brought me back and deeper. Mm -hmm. and And I had learned more by this point. I had more pointers on what to do, I got really curious about something that was called the fourth state. Waking, sleeping, dreaming, and then... Turiya. The fourth, Turiya, the fourth state, mm -hmm. the one that's like deep sleep with no content, but you still have awareness. I got real curious about that for whatever inner guidance was bringing me along. Mm -hmm and giving me energy. I didn't have energy for much at that point, but I had energy for doing that. So I would do these long meditations <clears throat> and I had to do them lying down because I couldn't sit up that long. Long meditations where I would subtract. There was a subtractive process, meaning I would close my eyes so I wasn't seeing and then eventually sounds would also subtract away. Body sensations would subtract away just a sense of breathing in my heart would be there and then they would get slower and subtract away. And then it happened that it seemed like that was a portal of sorts to something I can't put into words that was when all the activity stopped, I shifted and felt that I was in my true home, my, you know, the, the heart of love, the utter essence, the womb, all these words are inadequate because they're not it. But that happened and, and it was utterly satisfying. Like, like I'd had to follow this thread until I got there because I had to know where I came from, where I was going, what I was truly, what I was truly. And, 
And I, for about a year, every, every so often, I would have another opportunity to merge into that. Just once a year? No, throughout the year, throughout a year or so, maybe a dozen times. Oh, okay. So maybe once a month you'd lie down and do this. Yeah, it wasn't on a schedule though. Okay. It was, it was, it was like somehow the, the right circumstances would show up and it would be like, like something was opening up for me. Yeah. And that's pretty characteristic, uh, and it's a classic description of the experience, really. And the Bhagavad Gita likens it to a, a tortoise withdrawing all of its limbs into its shell. You know, that the, sense, mm. the senses withdraw from their objects, and sometimes simultaneously, perhaps sometimes sequentially, as you described. And then, you know, the self is, realizes itself by itself without any sort of subject-object relationship going on anymore. Right. Yeah. So that was a very important learning for me, discovery maybe, mm -hmm. discovery. And that was, again, for me in this lifetime, that was really important. It's not always for other people, but it, for me it was totally important. And also then opened up the next set of bewilderment because it didn't change me, it didn't perfect me, it didn't remove the challenges of being human. Well, at this stage, was it in any way sticky? Was it in any way permanent? Or are you just once a month having this experience? It, it became a knowing. It became a knowing. It became a trustable knowing, even though life, you know, activity and sensing and all would, would turn outward again. It was After, kind of there in the background. It was there in the background, and by around 1995, I, it was just utterly trustable. Mm -hmm. And yet, I was still dealing at that point with, now what, is that, what does that do for my life? Yeah, right. You know, how do I live? That and a couple of dollars to get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so really, it didn't... I mean, uh, in, it didn't have any impact whatsoever on your life, or what, did it just, I mean, it didn't sort of diminish the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to some extent, or? Well, it, yeah, it had, it had tremendous effect in certain ways. It, it just didn't relieve the confusion of, about being a bewildered human. Yeah. But, but to some degree, it, it relieved the confusion about who I was, and it was the end of seeking. Yeah. From that point on, I really wasn't seeking. I was just exploring now. What does this mean? You know, I still have, I'm still thinking, I'm still having emotions, I'm still reacting, and I'm still attached in various ways. And uh, I think I was quite clear that I wanted to help other people awaken, and yet did not feel in any way really like I was qualified. ready for that or yeah. qualified or knew how. There was, there was a, I, I became more and more comfortable living in a state of not knowing. I'll put it that way. But at that time I had no framework for how you be a teacher if, uh, if, if, if you're living in a state of not knowing. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I like your distinction between seeking and exploring. You know, it's somewhat in vogue to for people to say give up the search um, but that that's just words and a lot of times people hear those words and they're really not they're still really in seeking st mode you know they haven't had that experience you've just described and and so it doesn't it leaves them kind of frustrated I think to try to follow such advice um, but there's definitely a time when a certain phase has passed and one you know feels a contentment uh, that so so that sort of that emptiness isn't gnawing at you all the time, and so you you do feel like there's a relaxation of seeking, and yet boy, there's there's certainly plenty left to explore, no end of it. Um, so I like that distinction. Anyway, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yes, I think it's an important one. Yeah. And and I don't know that you can stop the search by act of will. I think it it doesn't stop until it's completed itself in a certain fundamental way. 
Yeah, in fact, I think sometimes when people hear this advice to give up the search, it only adds a level of guilt because they find themselves still kind of seeking and craving and they think, what's wrong with me? Why, you know, why can't I stop the search? <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's just good to have this understanding that at a certain phase of our development, it's natural to have this seeking energy. And at a certain phase, it's natural for it to drop off. And so just kind of be honest with where you are and, and uh, you know, go with it. Oh, Rick, so much of what we encounter in spiritual teaching, I think, only serves to create anxiety and guilt and sense of not being able to do it the way we're supposed to be doing it. Yeah, we I often get emails from people saying, what's wrong with me? You know, I've been uh, tried so many different things and nothing has worked. And, you know, it just becomes a kind of a way for people to beat themselves up. And it shouldn't be that. Well... Beating, pe beating yourself up is something people are really good at, <laughs> in my experience. Yeah. And it's heartbreaking for me to see how people do that and how much, how much pain and suffering happens along that line. And that's one of the things I really love about the kind of work I do with people is that we really help people soften those edges around that. Yeah. yeah. I, we'll be talking about green lighting after a while. I think that probably relates to what we're saying right now. Um, all right, well, let's, let's continue on with the, with the biography. Sure, sure. Um, around that time, I did drop out. I, I, so before 1995, you know, in those years, the early 1990s, I was in this dark night passage I was having discoveries, but I was also being undone. And I had no energy for being productive in the world. And I basically, that was my first time of living in an RV. Mm. I borrowed that off the boyfriend I was breaking up with and ended up traveling for three and a half years just in a kind of free flow of wandering, wandering in the wilderness. Mm. How'd you that, avoid, how'd you buy gasoline and food and stuff like that? Or you had some kind of... Some... Well, okay, so proceeds from the house I'd had in California bought me a little bit of gas and a little bit of food, and, and I lived quite frugally mm. and stretched that out for as long as I could. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I had to drop out. I, at that point, tuning into what my body wanted... More than anything, Rick, it wanted to sit under a Bodhi tree and have someone bring me meals. Okay. Oh, look who we got. Dog break here. This is... Oh, dog break. Uh, she came around, had to introduce our new dog. This is Luna. And uh, Luna. we picked her up from an animal shelter down in Illinois. And she's doing pretty good. She has, a, she has some kind of kennel cough thing going on that we haven't totally figured out. Um, It'll probably pass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here you uh, take Irene so she doesn't you. tangle up in the wires. There we go. Thank you. Hey. Okay. And uh, oh, there. so sweet. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> She's got She's about 15 pounds. Her ears usually cool. Yeah. <laughs> she says, I'm sleepy. Yeah. We're losing her head there, Irene. Uh, shoot. <laughs> All righty. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so sorry about that. You, you, if, when your dog comes around, you gotta lift her, lift him up or her, and uh, yeah, Tucker, so. come here, come here, come here. Fair enough. Dog break. Come on, come, come, here. come, come. Ready? Jump. Come on. One, two, three. Come on, jump. Come on, let's go. Here we go. Okay, this has to be in my lap. All right. Hey, oh, so, uh, what do you call those? Australian shepherds? Australian Shepherd. I love those dogs. This is Tucker. Oh, he's beautiful. He's a little bigger. He's 35 pounds. Uh-huh. Say hi, Tucker. I love that, that? two different oh. color eye thing that they have. Hi. <laughs> there we go. Say hi to everybody. He's great. Hi, Tucker. Hey, you was sleeping. Yeah. Beautiful. High Thank energy you. dog. You must, you must get some exercise with him. Oh, well, he's good for me in that regard. Yeah, gets you out there. But he's a great Frisbee dog, so. Yeah. I, he gets a lot of exercise while I just stand still and throw the <laughs> Oh, well, at least your arms are in shape. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in the night. Oh, my first stint in an RV, dropping right. out from the world yeah. from life. So, so really, my odyssey after the sense of knowing myself, knowing knowing who I am, what I am, stabilize was stabilizing. I was still dealing with. Um, the kind of the emotional fallout of the pain of my life or maybe the pain of being human mm -hmm. and and I was experiencing that effect that people do get when people say well you shouldn't be feeling that or you should be able to fix it you know if you just if you just do your right healing work that wouldn't be happening anymore mm. and yet yeah, there was this persistent kind of deep, melancholy, sad, grieving, feeling quality, feeling tone, when I would sense inward. Do you have a sense, uh, did you then or do you now have a sense that um, that kind of transcendence experience that you were tapping into was acting like a solvent and kind of loosening things up that were all sort of stuck and calcified and, and um, you know, beginning to, you know, to facilitate uh, catharsis or transformation going on in, inside you? Well, it was definitely pulling things up to the surface. So that's, yeah. that's a, a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. and, and I was going deeper with that and not just being, you know, on the surface reactive or, uh, you know, but I was, but I was feel, sensing deeper and deeper and going into what what is here what is here at the base of my experience and why isn't it just totally peaceful mm. because when i would shift in and when i would shift away from outward experience and and fall totally into that inner no space <laughs> non-being you know there all the questions resolved there was total love, total peace, total security, safety, total relaxation as that. Mm -hmm. And then, but there was this other stuff going on, you know, in me as well. Yep. And I just had the sense that there, it was like apples and oranges, and yet I had this quest to find a way for them to integrate. Mm. Didn't know how to do that. Didn't know how to make that happen. Didn't really have much in the way of teachers at that point. But I sensed that the solution was not simply to call my humanness unreal in any way and try to get out of it, but was to stay with it and find the integration. That's good. You know, it's might, might want to interject here that um, people who have really emphasized calling their humanness unreal and and trying to sort of escape in well, it's pejorative to use the word escape but who, who've just really pushed on that angle um, there are many cases um, getting reported to me in which people have really gotten themselves in trouble by doing that you know it's, it's almost like they've intentionally cultured a sort of a schism or a you know a split in their personality and um, you know brought on some kind of a you know, rather serious dysfunctionality in their lives. So I just want to sort of bring that out again because it's still mm -hmm. in vogue in some spiritual circles to try to do that, or at least the way it's presented, people get the impression that they're, they're supposed to try to do that. And um, it can actually not only not be helpful, but can actually get people into trouble. Right, right. Well, we've learned a lot. We're learning a lot. I think the whole exploration of the human psyche is growing by leaps and bounds and we're getting new discoveries especially through neuroscience now that are starting to corroborate certain things <clears throat> and certain ways of psychotherapy that are body-based are bearing a lot of fruit for helping people get integrated yeah. in yeah. ways that probably weren't much available to people in earlier ages and earlier spiritual teachings did the best they could with what they knew. 
and yet I think the potential now is for a lot more integration of the whole self. So the all the transcendent dimensions and all of the embodied dimensions of what it is that we are. And including the interpersonal dimensions of what we are, the way we're not separate from one another. Yeah, I was just talking with Francis Bennett last night, and he, he was a friend of mine. He just did a thing with Adya Shanti the night before um, up there in California, and that was the whole theme of their presentation to about 300 people. And um, you know, Francis made the point that a lot of times what people call non-duality is really not non-duality, it's a duality because they've, they've sort of um, estranged themselves from a whole major section of their life, their, their, hu their humanness and their body and, and so on, and just sort of taken refuge in, in a detached or transcendent realm and considered that to be non-dual, which it is in and of itself, but it, if it's excluding a, a major portion of life, then then it's really a, more of a duality than we even started with. And, and so the, the direction we would want would be to have a, a large, if we want non-duality or to think in those terms, we want something much more inclusive that, that in, embraces the whole package. Right, I like to use the term radical embrace. Good. For what I just described. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, because we can radically embrace absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's not about whether we like it or don't like it. I mean, we could radically embrace our liking and our not liking. And our, you know, all of the range of experience can be, can be welcomed and included. And it can be seen to be totally not. You know, the, the duality happens when we say, I'm enlightened when I'm feeling peace and bliss and I'm not awake or I'm not enlightened if I'm feeling sad or despairing or depressed or angry. And, and that's a fallacy. It's a fallacy. I mean, CC angry is every much as consciousness expressing herself, you know, as she is when she's sitting quietly and uh, just being at ease. Yeah, but can, can that be taken to extremes? I mean, I can, you know, the traditional scriptures talk about equanimity and things like that, not getting overly uh, upset in, by failure or overly rejoicing in, in success, but having a, it's like the analogy of, you know, if you're a pauper, you gain $10, it's a big deal. You lose $10, it's a big deal. But if you're a millionaire, yeah, you can gain and lose hundreds, thousands, and it really doesn't make, it does, so that you still have your ups and downs in terms of those gains and losses, but it doesn't shake your, your status as, as a millionaire. And sometimes you hear people talking in a way that, to my mind, sounds like it belittles enlightenment in a sense that, oh yeah, you can be enlightened and still be suicidal or deeply depressed or something like that. And isn't enlightenment worth the term a, a development in which you know, extremes of darkness like that would have been worked through and, uh, you know, in, infused with light or bliss or whatever so that, um, you know, you'd no longer be susceptible to them. Well, you just, you just opened a big discussion, Rick, well, that's okay. by that's that. Okay. We'll do that. <laughs> Let's do it yeah. because I think it's important. I, I think there's awakening I, I would make a distinction that there's awakening and there's enlightenment. And certainly in the waking down framework, we speak of a second birth awakening. Mm -hmm. And that one can very much coexist with any state, including deep depression, and does. And that's because it's not yet fully integrated. And that's what I was talking about in my in apples and oranges. Yeah, in the 90s phase. phase, yeah. Right, right, right. It wasn't fully integrated, and that full integration is taking years. Mm -hmm. And as I become more and more integrated, I am there is a stability, and there's a sense of never losing touch with this profound self-knowing that's profoundly at peace with life, with living, with everything here, and celebrates it and and relishes it, and yet. It's also fully given, in, I'm fully given into life. So I won't say 
So let's take the fact that I found my true love when I was about 50 and we had eight years together, mm -hmm. which were so wonderful in so many ways. Devastating, wonderful, exciting, terrible, you know, heartbreaking, you know. I mean, we had the whole love story, you know. We so had, you had eight the, years and for five of those he had cancer. And for five of those he had cancer and 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 I'll tell more of that story in a minute. And then I lost him. Mm -hmm. He did pass and 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 that was the most excruciating experience I you know, I imagine anyone could ever go through was walking forward into death with him and then it's like we were so merged it was like somebody was peeling duct tape off my skin you know to have me experience the separate the bodily separation from him so my awakeness did not i would say the opposite of did it didn't buffer me it enabled me to stay fully present to every bit of that journey right all the way into and through and, and of course, ongoing, because it, it is still ongoing. Sure. So, well, well, but maybe uh, oh, equanimity, as I've discussed, presented it, is not a buffer or an anesthetic as so much as, as it's a, um, well, it may serve as a buffer, but not by numbing you in any way, but rather by giving you a larger context in which to be grounded, such that, yes. such that tragedies or triumphs uh, don't rock your boat. Uh, or don't shake your world to the core as much as they might if you had no such foundation. That's well said, Rick. Yeah. That's well said. I would say that's quite true. Yeah. It enabled me to, to, to do what I did, to make it through, and also to, to be able to utilize support from many, many sources. Right. That, right. you know, that's become a skill I have that I did not have before. Yeah, um, and which many people in the world don't have. And, you know, you see people utterly devastated by tragedies of various kinds and, um, you know, severely traumatized. But you, you realize that if, you know, if they had more of a foundation of the type we've been describing, it's not like they wouldn't feel or they wouldn't care or, you know, or, or whatever, but they, they would just sort of, you know, there's that saying in the Gita, know that to be indeed indestructible by which all this is pervaded. So that there's a sort of an indestructibility that gets kind of aw awakened in your nature that um, hell or high water cannot, cannot shake. Right. And that's very true. Yeah. It's very true. It's very solid. Mm -hmm. And it fundamentally knows, you know, I mean, I fundamentally know that I'm okay. Yeah. And that whatever happens is okay. And I can meet it, you know, meaning in that sense of I can, I can meet it and I, you know, and, and I will meet it and, and it cannot take away what I am. Yeah. Not, yeah. not, it, nothing can take that away. So, solid. It's, it's even called the rock like in Sanskrit, kutasta. It's, it's said to be like a rock, you know, imperturbable, unshakable, indestructible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, we've got a few threads going on here now, <laughs> and <laughs> and we haven't totally got you know we we are still we left you back in the '90s, and <laughs> we're moving you along here uh, and, and to eventually finding the waking down community, which I believe happened in the late '90s. So so where would you like to pick up the story from where we left it? Right. So I'd say through the '90s I was often <clears throat> kind of traveling alone in the wilderness metaphorically or literally Meta or well sometimes both. literally and sometimes <laughs> metaphorically yeah. and um i was pretty much a loner i did have people and teachers and books and would check into things from time to time but i didn't have a community around me by any means and it was um a chance maybe a synchronistic um happening that i picked up a uh, book Samuel had recent Samuel Bonder had recently written called Waking Down. And as I said, my apples and orange phase, I was looking for a way to integrate. I was looking for a, a spiritual path that didn't, you know, favor one end of the polarity over the other. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, the transcendent or the, or the human, you know. And there was plenty of people who were doing one or the other, but not so much that I was seeing that was doing both. So it seemed to me that the point of waking down was that it was an attempt to do both, mm -hmm. to embrace our humanness without pulling, you know, and, and also be fully awakening. And so that was enough to get me curious. So I traveled out to California to explore and, and I kind of got caught up. I got hooked. I loved the people I met, Samuel and Linda and Faye and Ted and Hillary and Van and uh, the early teachers in those days. And they welcomed me and I just saw all the potential of it. In some ways, just the potential to be around people who could recognize what was going on in me, could see me and reflect me back, because I didn't have that kind of people around me at, until then. And one thing that was very important to me was that the, the people who were involved were finding their own voice and their own unique expression. It wasn't about parroting what one teacher was saying and quoting him and always trying to fit into his, you know, try to be like him. There was a real en encouragement for people to be unique and awakening as exactly who they were and find their own voice. So that was really important to me. I felt there would be room for me there. Yeah. Well, that's one thing I really like about the Waking Down community, um, which of course I've only known as a interviewer and as a friend of, of many of the people, but um, there's no parroting going on, you know, it's like there, there, there is an interesting balance between um, having a certain structure and, and certain ethical guidelines and things like that which are very important and at the same time giving people free reign to, you know, do what they're meant to do. Nice. Right. <clears throat> Right, so I, so in order, I didn't have any money, so because <laughs> I still hadn't found a, you know, a very productive way to engage in the world yet. I was still squeaking by, but mm -hmm. I, so in order to take advantage of the learning opportunity, I moved to California and volunteered to help Samuel in his work, and eventually we hel helped him make some money, and he was able to then start paying me. Oh, so <laughs> I, worked, I worked for him for a couple of years yeah. and then I became a teacher in my own way and moved back to Colorado, which was a favorite place of mine and supported a community that was getting established there. Hmm. One thing interesting about Samuel, I've, I've talked to him about this privately and, and all, is that, you know, I mean, Adi Da was quite a character. and. Um, you know, if you sort of get the inside track on some of the stuff that was going on with him, it's scary. I mean, the, the, the levels of decadence and, and indulgence in various things uh, were shocking. And yet, at the same time, he had this kind of incredible presence, apparently. And some very wonderful people have come out of that, like Samuel and uh, you know, Mercedes Kinkle and um, Sandra Glickman and, and many others. So that in itself is a conundrum to me, or kind of a paradox. Um, but perhaps that was, in a way, you know, kind of a roundabout way, uh, just what someone like Samuel needed in order to uh, establish something in which there was a, um, a respect for individual autonomy and at the same time a, a kind of a, an adherence to um, ethical guidelines and um, respect for people and, and no, not, you know, a lack of, of taking advantage of and abusing people and so on. Just, that thought just kind of came to me as I was thinking about Samuel and Adi Da and all. But any comments on that? Well, complex subject. Uh, again, we've kind of touched on the fact that awakening doesn't immediately transform personalities. Yeah. And, and so... And it, the, can, it can intoxicate egos. I mean, there can be That's powerful sure. awakenings which can just make you a total egomaniac. Right, <laughs> right. So, so there's so there's a concern there, and that's you know it's become a sad 
story that we've seen repeated many times of people who become um, awake enough that they attract other people to be followers and those people project onto them powers and perfection that they may or may not be really intact enough to handle. Mm. Um, and, you know, and there's, there gets to be all kinds of confusion around that. You know, what is okay? What's not okay? If I'm awake, if I've already accomplished that, then whatever I do should be, you know, considered to be an expression of divine being. Yep. And that, you know, I'm sorry. I find that to be bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, Some teachers you know, say that explicitly. And, yeah. uh, and, and can go way off on tangents in terms of the, their treatment of people. I mean, Andrew Cohen is a case in point. I interviewed Andrew shortly before he dropped out of his teaching role and, and went off to India and kind of disappeared. And um, he, you know, he's, he's sort of a good case in point in, in a way in which he kind of realized that he had, you know, despite his awakening, which was genuine, had really been kind of a, a screw up in, in many respects and decided I just can't. I don't belong in this role anymore. I'm going to go and work on myself for however long it takes. And he's still out there doing that. And pretty much no one has, has heard of him, heard from him since. Whereas others, you know, they just get deeper and deeper into it. And, oh, now I'm an avatar, you know, and it just gets more and more kind of weird. Right. <clears throat> well, so in the early days, the people around Samuel is a bit of a wild west and, and anything goes. And there was not a lot of understanding of power differentials. Mm -hmm. And I think that came in as, as the community around him was maturing, being able to notice the ways there were, there were things that were out of integrity and call them, you know, name them. And we started to create ethical policies and everyone in teaching roles was expected to sign on to these ethical policies and agree to them and and they have teeth you know especially as we formed in 2005 so the, so the work has changed over the years in 2005 um, 2004 2005 there was Samuel was wanting to move away from the kind of guru at the top hierarchical organizational structure and we were brainstorming different ways to accomplish that and held meetings and did planning sessions and eventually um, a team of three of us, Ron Ambies, Krishna Gauchi and myself, took on the task of creating some new structures and one thing we created was the Waking Down Teacher Association which now has about 40 members and is very much different than the prior structure because we put all our agreements in writing. We got really clear about what our agreements with one another would be and, and they became a requirement for maintaining membership. So, so at that point we had teeth. We had, you know, and not to be punitive to anyone, but to be mutually supportive of people and to become raising our awareness around these places where people, where teachers get hung up in their ethical problems. So around money, around sex, around power, those are the biggies. And yeah, so, so to be in a, in a structure where we all meet together and stay in communication. And if anyone's feeling like they're in a gray area where they're not real, where their ethics are fuzzy, they can get counseled. Yeah. Like, uh, if, like if they're, well, like in your case, you were teaching that group in Colorado and, and your uh, husband-to-be, whom you didn't know at the time, showed up and some chemistry started. And so you had to kind of step back and, you know, check with your fellow teachers, I guess, and stuff and think, all right, how do, how do I proceed with this in, in a way that's uh, not going to, you know, violate the the ethics of our group right 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 so yes i met michael in 2004 at a transfiguration retreat which is a week-long intensive mm -hmm. and i was serving as a teacher at that event and so yeah absolutely there was this rule that we couldn't 
act on anything during the course of the retreat, of course. Yeah. And yet, you know, you can feel the energy starting to move and he approached me at the end of the event about spending some time together and it was like oh we have to be really cautious right at this stage you know i want to make sure he's well supported and as it turned out he was he was working regularly with his own teacher and he'd been in the work for a couple of years he'd been through a lot already he was very strong in his own being yeah so so we were given stamp of approval <laughs> yeah to, with, uh, a, to with begin, a chaperone of course <laughs> to begin exploring <laughs> without a chaperone <laughs> um, uh, okay so i think what we've done so far now is we've um, kind of given people a sense that this waking down group that you're part of um, has a nice structure to it has certain standards that help to prevent you know a lot of the horror stories that happen sometimes in spiritual groups, but we still don't know much about what it is. Um, and so I'd kind of like to use your book as a, um, you know, as a outline for um, walking through what waking it down is and, and some, some of its important principles. Um, it's a really well written book and I've read most of it and uh, really enjoyed it. So do you have a copy there yourself? I do. Good. So let's kind of walk through it a little bit and, and use the chapter titles and so on and some of the subheads as main points so that we really get a comprehensive vision of, uh, you know, what waking down is. Does that sound like a good plan? Right, Rick. But I would like to tell our viewers that my book isn't exact. It, it's not like the Bible of waking down. Sure. It's my experience with people from my own, in my own words and with my own slant mm -hmm. on it. So uh, again, in Waking Down, we have room to do that. So some of the things in here are maybe not shared by all the teachers of Waking Down. Right. And yet the general gist of it and the heart of it, I like to think truly does represent what my colleagues would are also embracing and espousing and, yeah. and doing with people. And so there really is no Bible of Waking Down. Even books Samuel has written, you wouldn't consider the Bible of Waking Down because Samuel is not, his word is not the gospel truth necessarily, and, and, uh, but everyone's making their contribution, right? Right, right, right. Samuel has his own unique voice and way of expressing things, and he is also a fallible human being. Right. As is every one of us. And we, ha we do have something we call core dharma and teacher dharma. So core dharma would be the, the basic principles of waking down and mutuality. And that we all would say, well, of course. Yeah. We and then the teacher dharmas are the individual variances on those themes. Or maybe the further discoveries that we've been making since the early days when the kind of core principles were drawn out. And is it kind of expected that the uh, teacher dharma will, you know, be in a certain orbit around the core dharma and not, not go too far afield, or else it really can't be associated with waking down? I mean, if, if somebody right. decides that, okay, we're all going to drop acid and get into jello wrestling or something, then, you know, you go, better go do that on your own. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we call it related, you know, waking down related. Um, and, you know, of course, any, any individual can do whatever floats their boat, but, uh, but it wouldn't be recognized as a related offering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, let's uh, start by something you have in the Darkness Before Dawn chapter, where uh, you have stages of embodied awakening and about four stages. Be interesting to run through that. And keep in mind that we have maybe an hour now to kind of go through the, the various points in the book. And so let's pace ourselves so we get through it all, but cover things deeply, okay. as deeply as we can. Okay. Well, thanks for bringing up the four-stage model that I threw there in that first chapter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's my own model, and again, I'm not saying that everyone would agree that this is, you know, the best model ever written about human development, but I think it, I, there's, there's, some, there's a couple things that I think are important in this model. First of all, it's a very simple model, and I'm the first one to say maps are not the territory, and, you know, no one's going to follow this to the letter. But I, and it's, and there are all lines of development, um, many different lines of development that aren't being represented in this model. I'm talking about kind of 
a spiritual unfoldment model. Mm -hmm. And I call it four stages. I call it something that correlates with the, uh, the subtle body development from gross to subtle to uh, spiritual, you know, and, and then integrating all of that. So solid to liquid to vapor to, you know, what, what transcends and enfolds all of it. And a very, very simple way of saying it might be in the, in the, what I call stage one, it might be that your sense of the divine is completely other than you, completely separate. You know, I'm just a human and the divine is out there and all powerful and I'm subject to the whims of this divine. Second stage would be where a lot of, a lot of a much greater sensitivity to subtle and multidimensional experience is starting to happen where the person might be recognizing they too are part of a divine essence energy of the universe. And that's what I was describing when I said I was on a really rapid spiritual growth path and I was channeling and that's what I would say was my stage two journey. And then what I call stage three is when an integration happens and a landing. So again, as if stage two is when we're opening all the chakras and, and becoming much more open to um, all sorts of multidimensional experiences and levels of our being. And then again, as a way of speaking, and the words are never the whole story, but you could say then, then our, our spirit comes home to inhabit the physical being, the physical, emotional, mental being in a much bigger way. And that's why we say lands, as if it could come down and land, you know, plunk, right into the heart, right into the belly, right into the genitals, right into the whole being, and not just be floating around up here somewhere. And, and that's what we call, you know, the stage in which the second birth happens. And it's also a stage of paradox, very much so I'm not one or the other, I'm both and. I'm spirit and I'm body, I'm spirit and I'm emotions. And, and they're, they're all together, they're, but, they're, but they haven't necessarily totally gelled. We're just encountering paradox all the time and realizing that life is full of paradox. But, but there is a, a self, knowing as I am spirit, I'm, I'm consciousness. I am consciousness plus matter, and yet matter isn't not consciousness, it's all consciousness. So it's, it's when they come together. That was stage three, right? Right, and right. I call that stage three because it seems to me that a lot of people, when they hear about waking down and they hear about the second birth and then they meet people who are in the early stages, the first few years maybe of the second birth, they say, that person doesn't seem very enlightened. Hmm. You know, what's going on here? You know, are they just smoking dope or are they just kidding themselves? And it's because there's this deep integration that is underway, but is, like you said, turning up the shadow material. It's pulling that up to the surface. It's putting people through the, you know, the deep rapids of the awakening and the challenges of that. We call it the shakedown. It's pretty, can be a very turbulent time for people intensifying. So, so I, so I then spell out a fourth stage. And to me, that's when it all really gels. And, and it's less about feeling paradox than it is about feeling just a flow. It's like a, it's like a kind of a surrendered, a relaxed, a flowing, I we call, I call it seamless onlyness. So it's an even deeper integration, merging, blending, um, gelling of all that I am into someone who's just, just being. 
but being, you know, in a way that's so much more informed than it was in the past. So much more whole. Nice. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about those. I think it's a useful model for people to, to uh, play with. Sure. A question just came in from one of the viewers that I'd like to um, ask to you. Um, in my process of integrating my awakening, it seems sometimes there's still some kind of energetic pressure in my head and sometimes in my neck. Can you say anything about energetic pressure during the waking down process? Thank you. Hmm. Wow, probably nothing simple. I mean, all kinds of phenomenon happen during the awakening process, and that can include uh, kundalini energy moving in all kinds of different ways, and it may be pooling in particular areas for this person. You know, where, where attention is going to certain areas and amping up the pressure or the energy in that area. It may be that it's potentially beneficial, that it's actually helping to, to um, open up certain areas that might have been constricted. Mm -hmm. Or it might, be, it might be that it's uh, too much, you know, that it's more than the system can handle. So it might be useful to get some support and coaching for running the energy in different ways, grounding it, you know. Bring it, pulling it down and not necessarily having it just all be building up in one particular spot. Mm. But it's a complicated, I mean, it's a challenging and complicated process to awaken as a human and have so much energy coursing through our systems. Again, it's like, it's like running higher voltage through thin wires. Yeah. And yeah. the thin wires can't handle that. So part of awakening and part of why I think it, why it comes and goes for people is that when it recedes, when it seems to have left, is an opportunity for our wiring to catch up. Yeah. You know, and then the next time we get to run a little bit more voltage through the system. Yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, obviously the, the body is the instrument through which anything is lived, any experience, uh, what to say in awakening or enlightenment. Um, and so uh, it's pretty well traditionally understood that for a, a really significant shift in the way we view the world and the way we live life and the way we experience, there's going to have to be a correspondingly significant shift in the instrument through which we do that, you know, in, in, in the body, the nervous system, subtle levels of it, chakras and all that. As, as a waking down teacher and, and teachers in general in waking down, do, do they um, sort of recommend other therapies and things like you might say, oh, you, maybe you should go and get a massage or get Reiki or go to a psychiatrist for that matter if, if somebody seems to need something to supplement what you're doing with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're fortunate now that there's so many practitioners in so many related fields that have good skills and good technologies to help people. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. And there's no blanket answer to that other than, yes, we're very open to having people find the right kinds of support processes to ease their journey. Yeah, so um, moving into your book a little bit more here. Uh, dark night, how do you know if you're in a dark night? It's a very, I, I've had people actually send in emails to, and say, you know, would you please ask everybody you interview about the dark night? I need to know more about it. I feel like I'm going through it. So, um, you know, you've referred to it in terms of your own experience. How does a person know if they're in a dark night? Well, I actually, in chapter one, give a list yeah, of you points do there. Mm -hmm. that uh, might be helpful for people. Yeah, but I read do. some of them. Go ahead. Oh, no, obviously. you read some of them, yeah. All right. Yeah, if you find yourself we could say running out of steam. If you're, you're not ready for another self-help program, you're not necessarily looking for a guru, you suspect that maybe some of the stuff you've been taught is inaccurate, but, and it's not sufficient to what you're dealing with now. Um, you're questioning all your beliefs. Maybe you've, uh, you're, you know, your practice just doesn't do it for you anymore. Maybe you've left off your practice. Maybe you're just feeling um, like it's not taking you where you want to go. Um, I would say that there could be uh, degrees of darkness, couldn't there, with dark nights? I mean, there could be dusk nights, and there, and there could be, <laughs> you know, where you can still kind of stumble along, and there could be pitch black nights in which you can't, you know, find your way at all. And, um, you know, 
some which could be just mildly depressing, some which could, you know, make you consider suicide or actually commit it. Uh, so, so we don't want to oversimplify the term. Thank you. I think that's very true. And some might not have any outward, you know, they might not fit that kind of dark night description at all. It's really, it, what's really happening is that there's an undermining of the structures of our psyche. Mm -hmm. That they're they're soft the the edges of those are softening, so like for me there was a sense that oh my God everything I've been learning is all about a belief about reality it's not necessarily reality and um, and just falling through the you know falling through that and into what do I know in that state of not knowing mm -hmm. so. So it might be a very internal thing, it might be very subtle, and people's lives might go on just pretty much as normal. So they may or may not feel like, oh, everything's falling apart. I wonder if the darkness of a dark night might be in a way related to how invested you have been in something which ultimately you, it would be in your best interest to, you know, shuck off. That, that's, that's good consideration. Yeah. I do want to say that not all life passages that are painful are dark nights. Mm -hmm. And there's there's depression that's not a dark night. So just because you're depressed doesn't mean you're in a dark night and vice versa. Um, and so I do want people to get appropriate help, especially if they are feeling really dark um, and or if they're feeling like life's not working. You know, I, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, I had a young friend who uh, was still alive when I started this series and ended up, and he was a very spiritual guy and uh, everybody loved him, and he got into this real dark thing and he kind of gave it a spiritual spin, you know, um, in terms of his not really belonging on the planet and things like that, and he ended up killing himself, and uh, it was a real tragedy. Um, so I'm think, I think what, you, what you're saying there is important that we shouldn't just sort of like, we should seek help if we need help and, and not assume that what we're experiencing is just, you know, some kind of spiritual uh, transition that, and that we, we're competent to, you know, handle it entirely on our own. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. In fact, that's part of my life purpose is that people not have to encounter this alone. And so I offer my support and, and, and I have many colleagues who are offering their support. I think it's, it's really tough. It can be really tough to encounter the starkness and, and just sheer hard time of being a human at times. Mm -hmm on your own. And I really want people to know that support's available. And, and not necessarily only through people like Waking Down Teachers. Obviously, there's all kinds of useful therapies that also are good and, and useful for people. So Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I think John, George Harrison wrote a song called This Too Shall Pass, or maybe it was the name of one of his albums. But, you know, you got to realize that everything is a phase and whatever we may be going through even if we can't see a light at the end of the tunnel there, there's going to be one uh, sooner or later <laughs> we just have to sort of like um, keep on keeping on you know and not not despair and that that's easier said than done perhaps especially if, if one is in a really dark time but uh, you know you were saying earlier about a realization that you are loved by some higher intelligence in the universe or something and um, however one can whatever one can do to remember that and um, realize that there is a brighter future if even if the present is dark and if we just kind of have the, the intention to keep keep evolving and growing and I'm, I'm kind of dwelling on this stuff because here in Fairfield there have been a number of suicides over the years and they're actually people mm. they're starting to take it seriously and have meetings at the local university and in town and try to prevent any more and these are you know largely people who had a spiritual background you know grew up meditating perhaps as children and so on and so it's really tragedy when that sort of things happens and 
anything we can say in this interview that might prevent that from happening to one even one person would be well worth spending the time on you know absolutely rick absolutely it's just heartbreaking how how deep people can go into darkness and despair and especially if they feel it's hopeless i think of course, it's, it's easier to say it than it is to do it. And yet, from within a place of depression, we project um, that it's permanent. I mean, it just seems to be part and yeah, parcel of like... depression that, that we, we assume the time is going to stretch out forever into, into the future and it's always going to be this way. Yeah, it's like when and... you have a terrible flu, you can't remember ever having felt healthy. You know, and you feel like, right. I'm always going to feel like this. Right. And then, you know, yes. a couple weeks later, you're feeling pretty good. Right, right. I've made a pact with myself when I'm sick like that, never to make any tr any conclusions about reality. Yeah. Because my conclusions at that point are going to be really grim. <laughs> Here's a nice little comment that somebody put uh, sent in, and we'll then we'll continue on. He said, "It's great to see this woman expressing real and true and present pain. It is so often missing from spiritual teachers. This lady sounds like the wise woman who built her house on in the rock." Hmm. Mm. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there's a section in your book on page 33 that, uh, you know, when you gave me some notes on what to read, if I couldn't read it cover to cover, you wanted me to make sure to read, which was heart openings and other surprises. And then right after that, there's a section on divinely human teachers are divinely human with the emphasis on human. We've kind of already covered that, but what, what did you want to say about this heart openings? Um. I don't know. What did I say about? <laughs> oh, I have to re oh, don't worry about it. If <laughs> I'm not going to reread it now. All right, well, let's think, go ahead. I think I think it was on. You know, we were speaking. I was speaking about transmission, mm. and um, so transmission is that kind of body to body non. Well, it can be verbal, but also can be very nonverbal communication. When somebody is fully living um, from that grounded condition in spirit, that they. Other people can template off of that confidence in being, but what also can happen is that you might find yourself falling in love. And um, because, oh yeah, you mentioned the word. Um, what was it? Tantric initiations. Tantric initiations. Yeah, that's a that's a interesting, fun term for what can happen when when because because to to be seen by another, to be seen deeply is something we long for. It's also something that tends to terrify us. But when we're seen and we find that it's safe and it's kind and it's compassionate, we, our hearts just respond and open. And, and that can be mistaken sometimes for it being, um, this is going to be my partner. You know, or it can, it can include a, a, a lustful sexual component to it. Because again, we are we're connecting up all parts of our being. So it might not just be heart. It might be heart plus genitals plus, you know, uh, desires. And <clears throat> so it's something that has to be navigated carefully, you know, not to mistake it for something it's not. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, it can be a very beautiful thing that's very, very growthful for all parties. So, I mean, everybody and his brother and his sister ends up having of infatuations and affairs and, and whatnot in this world. Um, so uh, whether or not they're a spiritual person. So how, are we just putting kind of a spiritual spin on uh, a, a universal phenomenon by calling it a tantric initiation? I, I wouldn't reduce it that far. I would say that it has, there's a divine, quote unquote, divine purpose to it. It's being recognizing being, mm. and maybe that does happen with ordinary um, infatuations to some degree, but this tends to be a more whole being, very accelerating kind of, very catalytic kind of a thing that happens. Mm. I think and you said, it, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, and it can, it can really take over, the, you know, bring somebody forward in a way that they hadn't been brought forward before. Yeah. And I think you said something in your book about the way to deal with it might very well be to, rather than acting out in some way, to just kind of cook in it, you know, to sort of cook in the longing or whatever phrase you used, and that that can be very um, 
what's that word in alchemy where it's a transmutative, you know, where it can, it can help to sort of energize and, and uh, enliven your system without causing ha wrecking havoc in your life. Right. Well, especially if it's if you've if you've uh, got this kind of opening happening with someone who's not your the person you're in a committed relationship with, then you know it's not necessarily about throwing that out the window and going and jumping into bed with someone new. You can cook in it, and you can you can also meet it with consciousness and understanding and get support around it. Yeah. And sometimes it is the beginning of a powerful relationship, as was mine with Michael. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot in Waking Down about the core wound, and I, you know, I've kind of pondered what this means over the years, and I, actually reading your book gave me some <clears throat> insights into it that I don't think I got before, um, maybe just because I have so many more years of growth under my belt, but let me give a stab at what, what you mean by it, and then correct me and, and elaborate. Um, as I understand it, what you mean by it, and not only you, but the Waking Down community, is that you know there is this paradox or juxtaposition between our divine nature and our human nature. And the divine nature is, you know, unbounded and blissful and eternal and indestructible and all that stuff. And the human nature is flawed by necessity. There's always going to be some screws loose or some wires crossed or, you know, some, some scarring from our past or, or whatever. And so there's always going to be kind of a rub between our, the, perf the perfect dimension of our life, of, of our being, and the imperfect. And that rub is the core wound. Is that correct? That's pretty good, yeah. It, and it's not just that we're flawed. I mean, although that's often true, it's that we juxtapose in our mind what is currently, which always has limits. You know, like I live in a house on wheels, and I have what a lot of people think is just a whole bunch of freedom. I mean, I can go all over the place, and I do enjoy that freedom, but if I, if I get into a beautiful spot in the national forest, the ranger comes around after two weeks and tells me I have to leave. So there's a limit, you know, so there's a limit. But I, I'm in my mind, I'm saying, you know, why can't I live, you know, by the ocean, you know, year round for free? And, and you know, the reality is somebody comes and kicks me out and tells me I'm trespassing or whatever. So. In our minds, we compare what is against our idealized sense of what could be. And, and then we tend to judge what is negatively. And that's a big part of what causes the pain that we call the core wound, the resistance to what is. It's like, oh my God, this is just not a perfect world, you know, and people do awful things here and, you know, and I, and I hate it or, I, or it makes me terribly sad. And, so that comes from um, feeling that there's something fundamentally wrong. Hmm. And so that feeling of something not okay or fundamentally wrong or flawed or insufficient is close to what we mean by core wound. Yeah. So you just kind of defined it um, with reference to the, the contrast between what life is as we experience it and what life ideally could be like, you know. Uh, whereas I was de def defining it by con with the contrast between, you know, the, the relative and the absolute, sort of. Um, I, I suppose that might be another dimension of it. Um, right, right. Yeah. They're both, those are both true. Yeah. You know, there's like an extension, existential truth of what you said, and then what I said is more about how the human how my human self responds to that truth, mm. you know, by feeling like I'm not good enough or I'm flawed or life sucks. <laughs> you know, there's something that comes to mind with regard to the way you defined it, which is that, you know, there's that powerful, I mean, there's that popular saying that we're, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. You know, it may very well be that we have come from someplace or lived in dimensions that times in our lives where in, in our lives in the big sense of the word where it really was quite heavenly and ideal uh, we were in some realm where where things were really sublime and celestial and then here we are in this gross demanding flawed apparently world 
And so there's some kind of residual remembrance of that more ideal state that causes us to, to feel like, you know, that this is never quite good enough for me. Right. right. So I call the core wound the portal because it's the portal to embodied awakening. Mm -hmm. You don't have to encounter the portal, that portal. You don't have to pass through that unless embodied awakening is where you're headed. Mm. But if you want to fully land and fully embrace be in that radical embrace of all that you are, the core wound is going to be very key to that. And you can't will yourself into the core wound and you can't jump into the core wound in order to get out the other side. It's just an, it is an existential condition of being a human being. And what you can do is let yourself touch into it and not assume that there's thoughts you have are necessarily the whole story or true. So we can get comfortable like my, my, the emotional quality I felt around the core wound was deep, deep sadness and grieving as if the world was just this massive pool of sorrow. And when I permitted myself to live as that was was very important. It, instead of trying to fix it or try to heal it or try to make it go away, it just became that. And then relaxed into it. And then it stopped. It shifted. Mm. It shifted, but not through any effort I made to make it go away. It shifted. So it's still, in a way, I can still remember that, but I don't live there <laughs> now. Yeah, so it did get healed, but it was more like well, when you say you relaxed into it, it was more like, uh, well, if we have a wound in our hand, we cut it. You know, it's like we can sit there and will it to heal and, and you know, um, obsess over the fact that our hand is, is cut or something and, you know, bemoan our fate and so on and so forth. Um, or we can just apply appropriate measures, maybe have some stitches or put a Band-Aid on, and nature will heal it. Uh, because nature has a healing tendency. So, you know, mm. the, the whole use of, your, of the word wound implies that the wound can be healed. Maybe a scar will be left, maybe it can't be healed entirely, but um, you're not saying, I suppose, that the core wound is, is an unhealable thing. You're, well, maybe it is in terms of ultimate, complete, utter 100% healing, but you're, you're also saying that the approach to healing it is not through, you know, individual volition so much as a, 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 re, a, a kind of a, a relaxation and a sensing and a dropping into and allowing ourselves to feel it. I'm, I'm talking too right. much now. You, I'm putting words in your mouth. You go ahead and take it over. Yeah, that's but that's good, Rick. That was that was well said. So the it the existential condition is just the existential condition of being human, and that's always going to be creating that juxtaposition or po potential rub mm. and I you know and I find I, I bump up against it in all kinds of ways I bump up against it when I'm watching you know what our government's doing with other governments you know I mean uh, um, <laughs> so so the but the the wound part the distress there is mostly primarily in a big way due to resisting it yeah that's People the go out of their way all the time to avoid feeling the core wound. And when you actually allow it, permit it, breathe there, you know, um, then it, it, you don't have to resist it. And when you stop resisting, and again, I'm not saying you can do this volitionally. Okay, I'm not going to resist it anymore. You know, I'm going to force you know, myself. You can't, you know what I mean? But you will, you will, if you get support and you start being curious about it, you can discover that you can live here as an embodied conscious being yeah and so would you say that an alcoholic a drug addict a sex addict a tv addict a, you know somebody who is just sort of an escape addict you know trying to escape in any way shape or form is when you get right down to it resisting their core mm -hmm. wound oh sure yeah i would i would i would say that that drives it drives the vast majority of human endeavor in some way or other that people stay busy in all kinds of ways, not just negative, but also positive ways. 
they stay busy keeping themselves preoccupied so they don't really encounter that uh at the core. Mm. And when they start meditating, you know, and start allowing themselves to, um, you know, to drop deeper, then they start to usually get a little more aware of what that might be. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing to feel. It's a good thing to make friends with. Yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. Um, I just want to do a time check. How are we doing? And oh, how we're doing much? okay. Another, another half hour or so. Okay. Good. All right. Just wanted to see. Yeah. Now we're doing good. Oh, so, uh, we might be able to cover. Okay. So I think we've pretty well done justice to the core wound. It's, uh, you know, I'm sure we could talk about that for the next half hour, but um, let's move on here. Um, and I just want to make sure to cover all the good stuff in, in your book. Green lighting. Let's talk a little bit about green lighting. Green lighting is, <laughs> it's a fun concept and, and it's very, very useful. It's one of, often one of the most, the, pink, the things people report is, as the most useful. And that is permitting yourself to be as you are. Mm -hmm. Giving yourself permission to be to be petty, to be selfish, to be flawed, to be incomplete, to be happy, to be miserable, to be, you know, to be whatever is happening and to be good at certain things and not good at other things. And what happens for almost all humans is that we get so trained and so conditioned and so programmed to always be trying to second guess if we're doing it right. You know, and then we get spiritual teachings on, on top of that, which tell us what we should be doing to be doing it right. And, or how we should be feeling if things were right. Or we, we encounter the secret and positive thinking, and then we think, oh my God, I'm not able to always control my thoughts, so I'm gonna be creating tragedy in my life. And, and we tie ourselves up in all kinds of knots. And green lighting is a first step of relaxing the knots mm. in our being and just saying, oh, okay, let me just be as I am for a while and get curious then about what I am, you know? So if we can let go of some of the way we're trying to make us be a certain way and just allow, then amazing things can start to happen and will start to happen and it can be profoundly healing. And it's not just it's not just saying, okay, I'm great the way I am and you know and 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 you know and blowing off everybody else. Um, yeah, I was it, gonna say I mean one might process. say, oh, okay, I ate all the macadamia nuts and there's none left for anybody else, but I was just green lighting, you know, so hey, you know, get off my back. <laughs> right. Mm. Well, that, you know, then that, of course, gets to a further chapter in the book on um, actually recognizing we're not separate from others and right. that their experience matters also. Yeah. 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 So people often misinterpret, though, Rick, that green lighting means green lighting um, all of your actions. And that's not what it means, because if your action is to punch that person in the face, you know, if that's your impulse or your impulse is to, to hurt people, then green lighting doesn't mean you get to go ahead and do that. Right. It just means the impulse to do it is human and you can forgive yourself for having the impulse. But yeah, so as, as with most things, there, there needs to be a balance, there needs to be discrimination. Uh, we, we shouldn't take these concepts to extremes and use them as some sort of alibi for acting like a jerk. Right. Right. Although acting like a jerk may be inevitable part of, you know, being who we are at times. Yeah. You know, hopefully we won't be a homicidal jerk, you know, or really, you know, we won't be, we'll be permitting ourselves to be bringing things conscious in such a way that they're, they're held in a, in a benign way. Yeah. In the TM movement, there used to be a term called unstressing, where you're releasing stress, you know, and uh, especially on long courses and people would sometimes do jerky things. And then, then they would they would excuse themselves by saying, "Oh, I'm just unstressing," you know. So it's like it, it was almost like an alibi for eating all the last slice of pizza or whatever you know that they were doing. Right. 
Right. In, in our framework, green lighting is just a way of opening to what is so you can actually look to see what's driving it. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. And it's important to look and see what's driving it because otherwise you are, you're not going to be bringing that consciousness all the way through your being. Yeah. So, uh, next chapter, in seeing. I like this one. Um, that if we could... You know, it's, it's interesting if you, you go to a conference or something and you, you hear all these interesting speakers and you're kind of getting a glimpse of their perspective, but wouldn't it be, able, wouldn't it be cool to be able to actually see the world through their eyes rather than just hear their talk? And uh, then, then you'd really get a, a very visceral and real and full sense of what they were presenting. Right, that's possible. I mean, it, and that's a fairly advanced level of in-seeing. As I use the word, it's, it's, I start with um, using in-seeing as a way to become more fully aware of what's showing up in me, in my reactivity, in my thoughts, in my feelings, in, in um, my ideas about life. And I find that these all are body-based, that there's a way of using in-seeing to invite what I call the inner body to bring forward information that is below the threshold of my thinking mind. So my thinking mind, I call like a, lin like a linear thought, 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 a thought track. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's the body mind, which I say is like a sphere. It's like it's 360 degree information, it's so much more full. And normally we just keep that right below our neck, you know, we, we not very aware of what's going on in there. And yet it's so rich and it gives us so much information. And if we surface it more intentionally into our awareness, then we're not going to be blindsided so often by it. We're not also going to be subject to just uh, re-experiencing the same old kind of reactivity over and over and over again. So in is a way of bringing that forward consciously and with curiosity and warmth and compassion to what I call the parts of myself. So there might be a part of myself that's, you know, that's okay, like a little five-year-old or maybe a six-year-old going to school for the first time. And she's a little scared, a little anxious, and she's hoping the teacher likes what she says. And she might really um, want to run away and hide. And if I can bring some warmth and attention to her, she's not going to necessarily have such an extreme reaction. And she might find it's okay to come out and play. Hmm. So it's, it, it's hard to simplify what it is. It's just such a rich, rich field of self-learning, self-knowledge. And practically speaking, how does one do it? I mean, are there techniques in the Waking Down group for you know, doing what you've just described? Well, the in-seeing is a tech. I have an eight-step process so that you'd have to pretty much pick up the book and read. Mm -hmm. um, and the in-seeing is something that I've put together. It's not something all Waking Down teachers do. Okay. So, um, and I base it a lot on what I what I learned by studying focusing, mm -hmm. which goes back to Eugene Genlin, um, 50 years, 50, 60 years of experience with that. And it's my own way of doing it that supports awakening. Okay. So it's bringing attention, it's inviting things forward, it's being a good listener to your own inner parts. So, and then it, oh, go ahead. it also, we also find that there's parts who are in relation to other parts and they can they can be some of the more entangled places in our being and why we often feel stuck mm. so there might be a part that's very playful and wants to come out and engage and there might be another part that's saying it's not safe to do that shut up mm. don't say that don't do that mm. and 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 then you can just get frozen right there you know do i do i not do it what but but you know and and there's a way to engage the different sides of ourself and actually make room for all of them. And what, what can do that is presence. And that's the next chapter. 
is presence. Presence is capable of having space enough and room for all of that to be occurring without it having to be um, fighting, fighting or, you know, a, opposing. So, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, um, a lot of times things we've been talking about and things various other spiritual teachers talk about, you know, are just people hear them as words and without presence, it's really hard to um, take them to heart or implement them. Um, you know, it's like, it sounds good, but you know, how do I do it? What, what to do? Um, so I, I kind of feel like, and your whole story started in a way with presence, you know, having that experience where you go deep into the transcendent and then things would start to shift. So what do you do as a teacher or does Waking Down do as a group to um, culture the capacity for deep presence in people? Well, that's, that's so individual. Hmm. So one thing is to say there's no cookie cutter answer to that because every person is unique. And one of the things that I think waking down generally does well is that we have a lot of personal attention for people. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just one teacher sitting up front with 50 or 300 people. Um, it's somebody who actually gets to know you, gets to track you, gets to find what, you know, what works for you and support you in that and, and cultivate it. So that's part of it. But another reason I'm so big on in seeing is that in seeing utilizes a state we could call presence. And that's a curious, warm, caring, compassionate state that can actually be cultivated like a muscle. So when when I'm supporting someone in discovering what's going on internally, I'm helping them find that state of presence for themselves. And the more they do that, the stronger it gets. The stronger it gets, the more they can begin to realize that presence isn't just a state, but it's also who they are. How do you help them find it? Um, Part or maybe of it's, it's individualized again. I'd say a lot of it's modeling. So we could call it templating or modeling or um, transmission. So because I am in presence with them and coming from that place, then they can see how it operates through me. They can experience it even in that nonverbal way. Mm. And the field of presence is being augmented by our interaction. And that helps people to discover it for themselves. Does that require physical proximity? No. Does, no, it's does amazing. It, is, does the it, physical proximity help? Oh, I think some physical proximity is a great thing. And, you know, desirable when possible. But, but over phone lines, over Skype, hmm. it, it also works. So in, in Waking Down, I know there's this thing that you do, gazing. Um, since we're talking about presence and transmission and all, would this be a good time to have a little gazing session? Oh, we could do that. Okay. Well, sure. why don't we do that? And you want to explain what it's about first before we start, and then when you, when you do it, just do it as long as you feel like a minute or two or whatever you, know, you feel is appropriate, and then we'll talk a little bit more after that. Okay. Okay, gazing is a form of connecting with another person non-verbally. And when you're connecting with someone who's living in this embodied, awakened condition, you can take, take advantage to come into resonance with the way that the frequencies of that, I guess, that, that um, your body can template off of or come into resonance with is, is about all I can say. And there really isn't anything you have to do with it. You don't have to have a particular attitude. You don't have to feel anything in particular. In fact, anything could happen. You might feel, you, you know, resistance to it or dislike of it. You might feel your heart opening and feel wonderful. So the whole range of things can happen and that's not really what's what it's about. It's just about saying hello being to being my being as expresses through cc 
is here to call being forth in other bodies. And so that's my love, and that's what happens with, with gazing, and that's the potential anyway. Yeah, and you say that it can even be done with a photo or with uh, a video. So this is not going to just be you gazing with me, but you, nor even just you gazing with all the people who happen to be watching live, but people who might watch this five years from now or something, it can have some kind of uh, value for them. Right, yes. Yeah. Yes, and... and um, just let it be whatever it will be for you. And um, I will spend a little time. I'm going to gaze with the camera, Rick, and all the people who might be served by this into the future. Glasses on or glasses off, or doesn't it matter? Uh, is the reflection a problem? It's a little bit reflecting, but uh, whatever you feel like. If you can see my eyes, we I'll can see them. We can see them. Okay. Thank you, that was nice. <clears throat> um, well, well you, is, is, should I ask a question or two now, or you have <laughs> more silence? Okay, good. Okay. While, while you were uh, asking, while you were doing that, some questions just came in, so let me just, rather than start off on something else, I'll ask these. Um, my, here, okay, here's this one first. Um, my girlfriend is really into non-duality, and I would like to help her understand the world. She is depressed and is having an existential crisis. She is a seeker after enlightenment and inner fulfillment. I am struggling to understand what non-duality is all about. I would like to know what's wrong with duality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, there's so many things wrong with duality. <laughs> Where do we start? I mean, in the world of form, you know, there's a there's a million great things and a million tragic things, and um, and he's seeing some of that in his girlfriend and what she's struggling with right now. So, um, duality and non-duality are concepts, and and. Um, I think it's just more important to be real and be human and and find our hearts and find what's in the way of our hearts being able to connect generally we've had lots and lots of experiences in life that have caused our hearts to shut down to fold to to become armored you know as if there's styrofoam packed around all our hearts and and a lot of our um or teflon <laughs> our teflon right a lot of our lack of satisfaction in life comes from the fact that we're not able to meet it, you know, with 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 a full-hearted um, being. So, so uh, whether it's you know whatever you're naming it, I think that's the most important thing. And I hope that 
he real this person the, the author of the question knows that support is available and there's people that can support her also, it's, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that it's not an either-or situation. It's not like we have to choose, the, as your book, in, book title implies, it's not like we have to choose the world of duality, human, hum, human, humanity, over the world of non-duality, divinity. Uh, the two can mesh and, and intermesh and intertwine and, and, and coexist and co-enrich one another. And that's really what we're talking about today. So and right, if, if non-duality is being used as some sort of escape, then, you know, as Stephen Wright said, I, I broke up with my girlfriend because she was really into meditation, uh, because I wasn't really into meditation and she wasn't really into being alive. So, <laughs> you know, it has to be an enrichment or an integration. Right, and both, both of those positions are, are a little bit too fundamentalist, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. and the, there's, there's the meeting place. Yeah, the both you know, end. There's a, there's a field and I will meet you there. Beautiful. And, and fundamentally, there isn't any such thing as divine versus, you know, material world. You know, there, it's all one, it, it's all one thing. It's a whole cloth. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I say it's, it's concepts. We, play, we like to play in the concept realm, which might keep us actually from direct experience. Yeah. Here's another one from someone. Um, well, here's one that's a follow-up from that earlier question about the pressure in the head, I think the person said. Mm. Uh, thank you for answering my question. Bless you. If possible, is there a technique you could recommend for getting the energy to move down? Oh, gosh. The simplest one would be put your feet on the ground. Walk around barefoot your... or something. Huh? Or the floor. It can be the floor. But, yeah, put your feet on the ground, and, and actually you can... You can visualize energy moving down, moving down your spine, out your tailbone, down into infinity, down into bedrock. You can ground through your feet. You can ground that way. You can lay on the ground. I mean, some of it can be done through breathing. You know, breathe into your heart. Breathe into your belly. Mm. You know, get curious about what's going on down there. <laughs> um, you know, and all that can help. Another thing you can do, you can open the back of your neck almost as if you had you had doors that could be opened there sometimes energy pools right there because it's a you know it's just a, a nexus and you can you can open it out and and visualize the energy moving cool um, and also, I, I would say, you know, sometimes physical stuff like gardening or ex certain kinds of exercise and all swimming, you know, things like that can be yes. nice and grounding. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Walking. Yeah. Um, here's another question. What are some beneficial techniques that my boyfriend and I can use to clear shadow aspects of ourselves? We are really interested in using our relationship to consciously catapult our spiritual progression and heal past experiences heal past experiences and, and triggers that romantic relationships are so good at bringing up. Oh, bravo. And I'm glad you've got a partner to engage in that whole exploration with you. And I wish you all the best. I would, I would recommend people start with inseeing and start, as they start to be cultivating that state of presence, learning what presence feels like and bringing that to their own parts then the next step, I call that inner mutuality, Rick. And then outer mutuality is realizing that the person sitting opposite you isn't a whole lot different than, than the, the kind of oppositional parts that we run into internally. And, and presence can be discovered to have room for even, you know, strongly divergent viewpoints to coexist without there necessarily being a conflict around it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there is a skill there and it's worth cultivating. Which has interesting implications for like the, you know, Israel-Palestine conflict or many other conflicts in the world. If there could be more presence in the collective consciousness then these seemingly irreconcilable differ differences, I think, could be reconciled. You know, it's just like, you need to, so who was it? What Einstein had that famous quote of not trying to solve a problem on the level at which it was, oh, you know, at which it was formed or something. You, you have to kind of move to a bigger context, uh, and then things which seem like there's no way out can actually 
reconcile and resolve. Right, right, very true, Rick. I, I'm, as you speak, and we, we're using the term presence, I want to say how I use the term, mm -hmm. because sometimes people use the term presence for what I would probably use the term consciousness mm. for, okay. which is like the, the absolute dimension, the, the, tr the transcendent dimension. But I have a very specific way of using the term presence, and I, we could say that is consciousness embodying. Mm. So consciousness, as it touches form, again, we're just speaking as a manner of speaking, as it comes into embodiment, it, pull, it picks up qualities of heart. So warmth, curiosity, compassion, caring about the human condition. And, and so for me, presence is a very dynamic and transformative um, principle. Whereas consciousness, which to me is, it's just the ever-present reality, but it, as a manner of speaking, consciousness doesn't seem to care. But presence cares deeply. Yeah. Does that make so? I, I just want to try to. Well, that makes to total you. sense. And um, you know, holding. I would say that what, what kind of what you're saying is that um, whereas consciousness has this aloof, sort of detached, and qualityless connotation to it, um, presence is the same stuff, but infused into life, infused into to the world, into the relative, kind of like you know sap, but in a tree, but then it flows and infuses and nourishes all the leaves and branches and, and so on. Right, right. In this sense, it's, it's, it is the, it's, um, it's the field, you know, that, that is very nurturing to, to, to all levels of aliveness. Yeah. And, and again, as I say, we can cultivate it as a state, but beyond it being just a state, I think it's also a fundamental principle and, you know, we could say it's, it's capital H heart, you know, mm -hmm. our divine love. But, but presence, I like the term presence because it's not just being present in the present moment, but it's, it's a sense of a field that's really being here, that's coming forward into embodiment. Yeah. And, and supportive of that whole process. Well, that's good. And, and I think it really does have societal implications. I mean, people are always talking about how there seems to be a global awakening taking place and so on. And, you know, and so that's why I mentioned the Arab, the Palestinian thing. I, I mean, the Palestinian-Israeli thing. I, I think that there's a um, kind of a, it's like a springtime taking place in the world where the sap begins to flow in the trees and so on. Uh, but so that, that kind of abstract, absolute unmanifest consciousness is, becoming more alive and more embodied in all of its expressions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think ultimately that is the key to the resolution of so many of the terrible problems that, um, you know, prevail on Earth, environmental and social and ethical and, and you know, all racism and all these different things is, is for people to become more divinely human, to quote the title, title of your book, you know, for the divine to enter into the human uh, to a much more profound degree than it has in ages past. And I really think that there's that process is underway, which is part of the reason it's, I started doing this show, to do my little bit to help facilitate it. And thank you so much for doing your show and your incredible archives, such an incredible wealth of information that you've amassed oh. and that you're sharing with the world so freely. It's beautiful. Well, it's just uh, my joy to do it, you know. I do know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing the same thing. We're on the same team here. Um, so um, I'm sure there's a million things in your books we could discuss, but there's only so much time. So people can buy it, and uh, right. they can get in touch with you. And um, uh, as always, I'll have a page about you on bathgap.com and a link to your book and a link to your website and so on, um, which uh, your website is divinelyhuman.com, is it? That's correct. Okay, yes. good. So we'll link to that also. And, um, you know, you obviously offer individual sessions and you travel around and all kinds of possibilities. Do you want to just enumerate those quickly or shall I just find that on your website? Well, I just started something that I'm really having a good time with, and that's a year-long program based on the 12 chapters of my book. Oh. And it's a, so it's a, I have a 
group of people, unfortunately it's already underway, so I can't take any more right now, but we're doing, uh, we're working through the chapters, but also doing small groups by Skype mm -hmm. and have a Facebook page. And I think that's got a lot of potential. And my idea about doing it for a year is to slow things down and really give people an opportunity to deepen together and be mutually supportive. So that's something I'm happy about and will probably be repeating again in the spring of next year. And so what, what can, so people, is there a place on your website where people can sign up to be reminded by email when you start the next one or something? Well, um, there's a sign up box on the front page of my web, my website, we're working on it right now, but it should be pretty well done in the next day or two. Okay, good. Um, if people uh, sign in and get on my mailing list, they'll certainly hear about that. I also am planning courses in, in seeing to help people deepen in that inner, inner and outer mutuality hmm. effect. So that so, will be. So people don't have to wait a year to get into your next thing. There's things they can do now if they want to contact you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks, Cece. This has been a lot of fun. Um, yes, indeed. Happy, Thank you happy so travels. Much. That went fast. And, yeah, it and does. So much territory to cover. So thank you for inviting me. Sure. As Kermit the Frog said, time's fun when you're having flies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, General wrap-up points, then. This has uh, been an interview with C.C. Lee, and it's part of an ongoing series. Um, as C.C. mentioned, there's a whole archive on batgap.com, which you can explore. And uh, if you go into the past interviews menu, you'll see it categorized four or five different ways. Check that out. There's an upcoming interviews page where you can see who's scheduled, and, and you'll see links to the live streaming thing. So if you note when the interview is going to take place, times given are in the Midwest U.S. time zone. Uh, when If you come at that time to that page, click on the link, you can go to the YouTube page where it'll be live streamed. Um, there's a donate button on the site, which I rely upon people clicking in order to be able to do this, uh, devote as much time as we do to it, so that's very much appreciated. There's a place to sign up for my email newsletter, uh, you'll see that link, and which you, in which you'll be notified once a week or so when each new interview is posted. And there is an audio podcast to the whole thing, so you can just listen while you're commuting or riding your horse or whatever, which people do. Uh, I get reports of people listening under all sorts of unusual circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you'll see a page for that, too. There's a whole page devoted to the different ways to sign up for that. So thanks for listening or watching. And uh, next week is someone who is not in the waking down tradition, but who will we'll also be talking about sort of using the body as a um, way of tuning ourselves more deeply to the divine. That will be John Prendergast. Uh, so I'm looking forward to speaking with him. So thanks again, CC. It's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick. Okay, happy travels. Drive safely. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs>